describes the turning away of the world from following the one true God. After the flood, the world became idolaters. And uh, you would think that after the flood, with all of the creation being destroyed, that people would say, let's get this right this time. Let's make sure we serve and worship the true and living God. But they did not do so. And uh, you might think they would be fearful that some other calamity would come forth because God promised not to use a flood. But there are still plenty of other things that could be done. And in fact, were in Sodom and Gomorrah where God rained down fire and brimstone. But nevertheless, instead of being certain to get things right in serving God, they all stayed in one place, though God had told them to go and fill the earth. Perhaps the Tower of Babel was to enable them to survive if God decided to flood the world again. We'll just build that thing so high he can't get that much water. Since they would not cooperate and keep the command that God gave them, God scattered them, changing their languages in the process. They were united in rebellion against God, so he would divide them through means of language, and they would never again be united except later in Christ. It is only in Christ that we can be united despite language barriers, despite race barriers, beside, uh, despite gender barriers. We can all be united together in Christ now. But there is a lot of division that occurred from that time of the Tower of Babel until this day. Now, as they went into various parts of the world, they developed their own system of idolatry, which oftentimes included committing immoral acts in the process of worshiping their idols. They considered themselves wise in worshiping what? Creatures. They considered that wise. Oh, uh... You, you don't think it's wise to worship a scarab or some other animal or a bird? Well, you don't even have a God that you can see. We're wiser than you are. That might have been some of the rationale that they had. But that was really foolish to worship the creature more than the creator, the one who created all things. In Matthew 15, we see, the text we're looking at tonight, we see that there is hope for the Gentiles. This is what happened after the flood, and all of those nations remained idolaters, but God chose Abraham and his descendants to be his own special people. The rest remained Gentiles. And they were, as Paul puts it in Colossians, without hope. They were without hope. But now there is going to be hope for the Gentiles. Verses 1 through 20 of Matthew 15 deal with how the Jews had departed from the law with their practice of it is Korban. Now you would think that the Jews would be faithful to God, right? Since he, they were his own special people. But no, they had been slowly departing from God. 
And one of the ways they were doing that was, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, with the practice of saying it is Corban that relieved them, they thought, of their responsibility toward their parents, thus fulfilling uh, one of the Ten Commandments, honor your fa uh, thy father and thy mother. By the way, there is a uh, proverb that goes with that in Proverbs chapter 28 and uh, verse 24. Proverbs 28 and verse 24 says, Whoever robs his father or his mother and says it is no transgression, the same is a companion to a destroyer. Does that sound like these people saying it is Corban? They were robbing their father and their mother of what they were due, the honor that they were due. And those who did that were a companion to a destroyer. This is not a... Uh, favorable description, is it? So the practice was shameful. So we had that in Matthew chapter 15 prior to what we're going to look at tonight. Then after Matthew 15, we have in Matthew 16, the Jews foolishly asking for a sign when the signs had been innumerable that Jesus had given to all the people. And it's right after that that Jesus warns them of the teaching of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So prior to this passage, we see the Jews' religion had deteriorated so that they were trying to walk their way around one of the Ten Commandments and get out from under the force of it. And on the other hand, just after this passage, Jesus says, Beware of the teaching, the leaven of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So we have complaints of Jesus concerning what Jewish religion had become. And they were supposed to be God's special people, but they're not acting like it, are they? And so that is counted. Uh, called attention to before and after the text that we uh, plan to look at this evening. However, between these two disappointing accounts of the status of the Jews, we find a promise of hope for the Gentiles who appear now to be on the ascendancy. They have been rejected for centuries, but now there is hope coming their way. And of course, part of that inv uh, involves Jesus dying on the cross for all mankind, not just the Jews, but for Jew and Gentile. Now, we have three events that occur in the rest of Matthew 15, as Jesus uh, goes from where he has been to the region of Tyre and Sidon, uh, chapter 15, verse 21. The second of these events, and we're coming back to that one, the second of these events was somewhere by the Sea of Galilee where Jesus went down a mountain and taught the people and fed the 4,000. Matthew 15, 29 through 31. Most believe that this was largely a Gentile audience that Jesus spoke to on that occasion. The third event is in the same locale. Uh, and so there were miracles in that area and there was the feeding of the 4,000 and that completes Matthew 15 except for the part that we want to talk about tonight. Apparently, Jesus was on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. Usually, he was on the western side where Capernaum and Bethsaida and, 
and those towns were. But here he seems to have taken a foray into a different territory than what he generally preached. But now we want to focus on the first of these three Gentile uh, areas, and that is on the Syrophoenician woman. Let's go ahead and read Matthew chapter 15 and verse 21. Then uh, Jesus went out from there and departed into the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman from, of Canaan came from uh, that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. So... Jesus is in this new territory where he has not generally gone before. And it is a woman of Canaan that comes to him. Now, uh, all of these descriptions are not in one chapter. Some are in Matthew, some are in Mark. And I believe it's, it's Mark uh, chapter 7 where it is said that she is a Greek and a Syrophoenician by birth. Uh, Canaan, of course, at one time referred to all of the land of promise that Joshua conquered after the death of Moses. And uh, it's unusual, in fact, this is the only time that the word Canaan appears in the New Testament. So a woman of Canaan, a very vague description. Greek is more or less vague, means that she was a Gentile, obviously, and not a Jew, and a Syrophoenician by birth. If you look on a map in the back of your Bible, you will find that uh, Tyre and Sidon are on the coast northeast of uh, Galilee. And... Uh, Phoenicia were, the Phoenicians were seafaring people, and they had cities on the coast, Tyre and Sidon. But to the north of that was Syria. And so she comes from that region north and east of Galilee. Uh, north and west, rather, of Galilee. All right, so the point is, however, that she's not Jewish. That's the point that is made and which will also come up as we look through the text. This section before and after these three incidents show the decline of the Jews as we've already mentioned. And, but this lady shows the promise that is being held out to Gentiles. So we want to take a look and see what happens here. In Matthew 15, 22, which we just read, she calls Jesus Lord and Son of David. How does she know that? Well, there could be various ways. The Pharisees and the Sadducees will ask for a sign, but she is already convinced. We don't know if she observed one herself or just heard the reports of what Jesus had done, but unlike the Sadducees and the Pharisees, she believed these things concerning Jesus. And so she calls him uh, Lord and Son of David. Uh, does she know the prophecy of 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13, the one that was given concerning David and that he would have a son of his own body who would build a temple. Of course, uh, part of that uh, may well refer to Solomon, but it says his kingdom will last forever. And Solomon's kingdom didn't last forever, but Jesus' does. Does she know about that prophecy and does she ascribe that to, David, uh, to Jesus, that he is the son of David? Well, apparently, she does. Uh, so, if she knows it and believes that Jesus is the son of David, she is not unlike 
Rahab, who knew that Jehovah is God. Remember when the spies went there? She, she knew who Israel was. She knew they were God's people. She knew that Jehovah was God. And this woman apparently believes the same thing by virtue of her having heard what he had done. So this woman knows some things about Jesus and she believes the evidence that had been presented to her. Uh, let's back up to, we'll, we'll be right back here in a minute, but let's back up to Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. Matthew 4, verses 23 and 24. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and uh, disease among the people. And his fame went all throughout where? Syria. And they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments. And those who were uh, tormented or demon possessed, epileptics, paralytics. And he healed them. Well, this is in her area. Uh, Syria is mentioned. She's a Syrophoenician woman. So she may have observed or she may have just heard of what Jesus had done, but she has retained it all this time. This is probably another two years later that we're reading about in Matthew chapter 15. So this is a very special person who has come to believe that Jesus is the son of David and believes it and is willing to confess that. But she has a problem. Her daughter is demonized. She is demon possessed. And that, of course, is a severe problem. Now, you would think that Jesus would be flattered that a Gentile, a Greek, a Syrophoenician woman, a woman of Canaan, would come to him, but his first response is to ignore her. Let's look at Matthew 15 and verse 23. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. Well, that is not normal behavior for Jesus, but maybe there's a special purpose going on here. Some think that when the disciples asked Jesus to send her away, that they simply meant she was a nuisance and please get rid of her. Others seem to think that they wanted Jesus to send her away by fulfilling her request so that she would no longer be bothering them. Give her what she wants, so she'll leave. But here's the response next in verse 24. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus seems to be directing those remarks to his disciples. They're the ones who came and said, she's pestering us, get rid of her. And he apparently is telling them this answer. However, she is probably within earshot. And here's what Jesus says. Why does Jesus say this, especially when he's in a region where he's bound to come in contact with some who are not Israelites. Well, he could have said this for her benefit, and uh, this actually does work out for her benefit. But I think it is more for the disciples' benefit so that they can see how a person with faith, genuine faith, responds. To Jesus. Let's look at verse 25. Then she came and worshiped him, saying, Lord, 
help me. She has drawn the conclusion that the Pharisees and the Sadducees rejected that Jesus is God. They refuse to admit it. They refuse to acknowledge it. They really refuse to acknowledge his miracles, which she understands. And she knows that Jesus is God and worthy of worship. This is tremendous for a woman who is a Syrophoenician, a Greek by birth. She asks for his help because she believes he's the only one who can help. Where else is she going to go? Nobody else can do what Jesus has been doing. Verse 26. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. It would be hard to refuse a, the plea of help that she asked of Jesus. Yet, he amplifies what he had said earlier about being sent to Israel. Only he couches it in somewhat insulting terms, calling the Jews children and her a little dog. At this point, it would have been easy for her emotions to get the best of her and to say, I don't have to stay here and be insulted. If she thought in those, in those terms, there's no evidence of it, she had come with one goal in mind, to have her daughter heal. And she is not about to leave until she is successful. That goal had not yet been achieved, and Jesus was still the only one who could grant her request. She could have gotten mad and stomped off, but she still wouldn't have got what she came there for. And she knew that Jesus was the only one who could heal her daughter. So she appropriately says in verse 27, Yes, Lord, but even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. As one commentator put it, crumbs from Christ's table are of more value than many loaves of the world. Well, how does Jesus respond to this? In verse 28, he says, O woman, Great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Her perseverance and persistence won out. What a great illustration of a person with a humble heart. Notice again what she did. Just to review this for a moment, she made the effort to see Jesus. She knew who he was, the son of David, the Lord, God, as evidenced by her worship. She persisted, refusing to take no for an answer. She worshiped Jesus. She was willing to take a place of low esteem, that is, a dog under a table, in order to achieve her goal. And she was rewarded for all of these things. Her daughter was healed that very hour. She knew that her faith and humility had brought this about. Maybe more importantly, the disciples learned that her faith was great. Do you think this might have been a good lesson for them? And we learn that her faith was great. 
and how great faith behaves and conducts itself. And so our faith can be great too. So long as we know who Jesus is, the power that he has, and the willingness that he has to save us from our sins. We Gentiles have hope. And they did begin the ascendancy in this first century, not too long after the church was established. So this Greek Syrophoenician lady from Canaan proved that God cares about all his creation, Jew and Gentile. The Jews got the first opportunity to obey the gospel, but the amount of Gentile Christians soon became far greater than those of the initial, those who initially responded, the 3,000 on Pentecost, which soon grew to 5,000 and beyond. But over a period of time, the Gentiles came into the church and far outnumbered the amount of Jews who had obeyed the gospel. The offer, though, is still for everyone, even to this hour. The means of salvation has not changed. It is the same as what it was in the first century. Obviously, this begins with faith. That's what we see demonstrated with this woman. It is not only faith, but great faith. Do we trust that Jesus is who we believe he is? And do we trust, as she did, that he will act on her behalf. Do we believe God will act on our behalf? Is our faith great, as hers was? And then second, of course, repentance. Repentance is not named. Surely, whatever sins that she had, she had given up for the purpose of having Jesus help her daughter. Nothing specifically mentioned, but surely she would not be a flagrant sinner coming to Christ for help, knowing that she was living in rebellion against God. So we presume repentance took place on her part. There is the confession of Christ, as you can see with her. She confessed him in several ways. Son of David, Lord, worshiping him as God. Now, of course, the gospel plan in its fullness was not revealed yet, and so there was no call upon her to be baptized. That message would come at the day of Pentecost when Peter was asked what they needed to do, and the answer from that point onward has been, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then there's one other thing, and we see this as a pattern in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. We see in verse 41 that 3,000 were baptized and added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. One must continue faithfully. That's how we have begun that is how we must continue. Notice that Peter didn't say after they were baptized, hey, well, you're saved now. It doesn't matter what you do from here on out. You can't lose your salvation. That's the message of a lot of people today, but it's not what Peter said. They were taught to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. Don't let pride prevent you from obeying the gospel, number one. Don't let it prevent you from repenting of your sins. I think pride will keep many people out of heaven because they don't want to acknowledge they've sinned. Oh, I'm not a bad person. Are you saying you've never sinned? 
But sin is what separates you from God and puts you in need of salvation. So if you're too proud to acknowledge that you've sinned, there isn't any hope for you. You have to humbly admit that you have sinned against God. And uh, then you can confess him and be buried with Christ in baptism where his blood will wash your sins away. That's why what salvation is for is to cleanse those who have sinned and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. So because we have sinned, we need salvation. But not salvation is designed by men or as taught by men, but what is taught in the scriptures. We don't have the right to change what God said, but many people have presumptuously changed the plan of salvation to exclude repentance or confession or baptism. But they are all essential. And so don't let pride stand in your way. And when you obey the gospel, and by the way, Matthew 5, 3 says, uh, Blessed are the poor in spirit, the humble, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you're lifted up and proud, you can't get in to the kingdom of heaven. And in fact, most people won't. They won't repent. They won't be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. So be humble, not proud. And then once you are in the kingdom of heaven, your sins have been washed away by the blood of Christ. Don't be lifted up with pride and say, well, I'm only going to do some of what the New Testament teaches. No, you've got to take it all. Nobody gave any person the privilege of picking what they want to do. It's all revealed by God and it's all what we all need to do. This evening, we offer that invitation, as we always do, either to those who have obeyed the gospel but have strayed, or those who never have repented of their sins and been baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. If we can help you in those respects, let us know this evening while we stand and while we sing this song of encouragement.